All right. Hello, everybody. This is James Stanley with Daily Effects. Just want to thank you very much for your time in advance. So I'm not going to belabor the point. I'm just going to bring up probably the most important chart in at least in FX, but I think this has some carryover into other asset classes, other markets as well. King dollar is angry. That's right. Uh, major breakout here in USD. This continued again through this morning. I'm trying to get some scope on this move, but it's it's really hard to do um, considering the veracity of how quickly this thing has went up and, and what's been driving it. Uh, so I've been fairly clear in my bias on USD uh, over the past couple of months. When I did the Q4 technical forecast, uh, it, it kept a bullish bias uh, onto the currency and it was largely resultant. I mean, the, the drive for that initial forecast I mean, it was really coming from here. I'm going to show you a uh, ascending triangle formation. So, I mean, to really tell this story, we got to go back to 2020, right? We got to go back to when the coronavirus first started to come into the equation, which was last February, March of last year. So initially, the idea was that COVID was going to be a business disruption. You know, if you remember back late February last year, there was some fear that it could come to the United States, that we could start to see you know, domestic business slowing down in the US. And I think the prevailing thought was that it was simply going to be met with a, a trove of stimulus from the Fed, Treasury Department, I mean, pretty much everyone. And that's what gave us this initial move of weakness in USD. Now, that, that weakness, it's, it, it quelled there in early March. Now, if you remember early March, it was, it was right around that second week of March when things in the US started to get shut down. Uh, I remember because I was supposed to be speaking at an expo that week. And, you know, I was I was looking at it and I was like, hey, this is pretty dicey. I don't know if I want to speak at this expo. There's coronavirus going down and you're talking about a auditorium in New York City full of people from all over the world. This doesn't seem like a smart thing. Well, it wasn't. That's when things started to freak out. And you can see where we had this really strong spike in the USD through the middle of March last year. What ultimately ended up settling this down was right up here. It was like March 23rd. That was a Monday. If you remember, uh, we had a long, I mean, we had a weekend. And then on the Monday open, USD spikes up, tests that resistance, and then starts to fall. There was a series of comments from Jerome Powell at the time. And he had said something along the lines of, there's not much that we can't do with the liquidity pro programs that are available to us. And when you have the ability to print the currency, you don't really risk a run on the currency because he could just print more. And I think that's what Powell was kind of hinting at. I mean, without, you know, the, the, the thought of inflation yet coming into the picture. So for the rest of 2020, the USD was taken to the woodshed. And it was largely because of these liquidity programs that the Federal Reserve had at their disposal to try to offset some of the inevitable business disruptions that we were going to see from COVID. Coincidentally, I mean, that's also what helped to trigger equities back up to fresh highs. But for the last nine months of 2020 trade, the USD was in a fairly decisive sell-off. It finally bottomed out here January 6th. I don't know if there's any link to everything else that happened on January 6th, but it was right there in that first week of the new year when the USD had bottomed out. Now, at the time, I mean, if you remember politically, I mean, it was, of course, you know, given the day, it was still kind of an awkward time. Still a lot of division in the U.S., but there was hope. We had vaccines that were on the way. People had even started getting inoculated by that point. And that's what led to the reflation trade. The reflation trade very much drove throughout Q1. And you can see where USD started to bounce here from that first week of the new year all the way up to the final day of Q1. Now, as that was happening, we were also seeing US rates coming back to life. That was a key driver here in that reflation trade. Right there, January 6th, or was January 4th, we bottomed out around 90 basis points on the 10 year. By the end of Q1, we had already ran all the way up to like 1.75%. That's a really big move in a very important asset class in an extremely small amount of time but it was driven by the same forces. We have vaccines. We're going to be able to reopen later this summer. We're turning a corner on COVID. We have all of this stimulus in the system. So the risk trade should remain at least okay because there is all that stimulus. 
that led to a really strong Q1. Now, as we went into Q2, what initially started as a pullback off that bullish trend started to get a little bit more troublesome as COVID numbers weren't really receding as they had hoped. And before you know it, by the end of Q2, price had already come down towards those lows, didn't quite take them out. But essentially, the first half of the year was mean reversion and range bound activity in the USD. So in Q3, I was looking for that range to continue, which it did. That range pretty much continued throughout Q3. It was towards the end of Q3 when things started to wobble a little bit more. And this is as the Fed started to highlight that they are getting closer and closer to paring back that pandemic driven stimulus. In the US dollar, this built an ascending triangle formation with that mean reversion. So we had that mean reversion earlier in the year. We had a horizontal zone of resistance. I have a couple of Fibonacci levels in that vicinity. Combined with the higher lows it had built throughout Q3, that gives an ascending triangle formation. Ascending triangles often approach with the aim of bullish breakouts. That's precisely what happened about a week after the September FOMC rate decision. That September FOMC rate decision was key because this is where the Fed actually starts to talk up the prospect of rate hikes. Now, they hadn't announced taper yet at that point, but you could almost see where Powell's trying to thread the needle to get into a spot where they could go more hawkish as opposed to a brash pulling off of the band-aid of here you go i'm taking away your taper or i'm going to start taper i'm going to take away your bond purchases and i'm also going to jack up rates that's a little bit too much at least from the fed's perspective it seems like it was a little too much to drop on markets at one time so september we get the warning of possible rate hikes that gave the breakout to the usd usd merely went up tested this fibonacci retracement around 94.74 and went into another range that range held all the way in to the November FOMC rate decision. That was just last week, two weeks ago, rather. At that November FOMC rate decision, Powell tapers, won't touch the topic of rates, the range remains, but what finally blasted this thing through was inflation. The inflation that the Fed had looked for for so long finally starts showing up in a very big way. Last week's inflation was 6.2%. It's the highest inflationary read that we've seen since 1990. And now markets appear to be getting in a spot where they're afraid that the Fed is starting to lose control, erring on the side of being a little bit too dovish. Now, with that said, we can see that equities are still holding near highs. But the one major takeaway from all of this has been the US dollar and this extremely strong and clear bullish trend. Now, in the Q4 technical forecast, we've already taken out a couple of the resistance levels that I was looking at for targets. 95 was one of those. That was hit last week. 95.86 was the next. That was hit this morning. I have one target remaining. I have one target remaining. It's up at 96.47. I have it on one of these charts. There we go. 96.47, and that's a pretty big zone of longer-term resistance. That 96.47 spot is right there. It's the 23.6% retracement of this major move, taking the low in 2011, drawn up to the high in 2017. And it meshes up with another Fibonacci level to create a zone, a zone from around 96.02, 96.47. Again, I'm looking at a long-term chart. Get a little bit closer. There we go. And we can see where that zone is starting to get closer and closer to coming into play. But this has been a strong and resolute one-sided run. There is no sign yet of this thing coming off. It could be really difficult or challenging to chase this at this point, but I think it's even more dangerous to question it or to say, well, it has to come down just because it's run so far so fast. This has been a strong breakout. This just continued to break, and there's a very reasonable rationale as to why that move is built in. Again, I think it would be very, very dangerous to try to question that at this point. Instead, I think the most that a trader in FX could try to do right now is to try to position around it. As in, if you're a little bit skeptical of continuation premise and topside USD plays, maybe you could extrapolate that somewhere else. Uh, I'm going to look at that today. I'm going to go over a series of major currency pairs, what I'm looking at, how I'm looking to follow them, and then I'll end with this extrapolation into how I can maybe even finagle my way out of USD exposure if that was the desire. And I'm largely looking at the yen. So 
I'm not going to leave you on any cliffhanger there. Uh, so one of the big reasons for that blast off in USD has been a absolute breakdown in euro dollar. Uh, I want to show you this chart because I often look at formations. Formations don't always work. They're not designed to always work. But if I show you formations when they work, I want to show you a formation when it doesn't work and where it's invalidated. So euro dollar, this is a falling wedge formation. Falling wedges often approach with the aim of bullish reversals. And if you remember, I've been talking about this one for, for some time because it was that 115 level that was almost like a trap there on euro dollar. You go down a little bit tighter and you can see where 115, it was almost like a tease point. 115.23, that was hit October 12. We come down, we get close, but bears can't quite test that prior lower low right here, 115.33. Uh, finally, November 5th, we tickle inside of that 115.23, but sellers won't let it get all the way down to the big fig. We bounce right back up. That 16.03 spot, multiple spots of resistance before it finally ended up going into breakdown. What ultimately brought this breakdown, and this was something that um, I remember very well, it was last week. Euro had come down to 115 and it just kind of like paused. But Justin McLean was on the desk and he highlighted that there was a massive, massive amount of euro dollar options set to expire at 10 a.m. that morning. And as those options expired, you can see where the slide begins. There's that 10 a.m., 11, 12, 1 p.m. We finally start to get into that 115 area. Two o'clock, we break. I mean, in later U.S. session through Asia, that breakdown just continued to happen and happen and happen. We finally did get a pause around this 1448 level. I was looking at that for a bounce so that I could catch resistance off 15, but that bounce did not come in. As a matter of fact, uh, as, as we open into this week, sellers just went for the jugular, pushed this right back down to, to the uh, 113 area. Go down a little bit tighter. That is a falling wedge that has been invalidated. Right, because the whole thing that was helping to hold this up, giving me this weaker angle on the support trend line, was the fact that we had this 115 support that was building and holding. But support or resistance can be taken out with enough persistence, which is precisely what we had with all of that USD strength that was pricing through. And now that prices have fallen below the, the lower portion of that rising wedge, the formation, uh, excuse me, falling wedge, the formation is invalidated. So there's nothing to work with on that any longer. Could possibly be some play off of that resistance trend line, but I mean, that's so far away at this point, it's neither here nor there. So I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of that one as well. Euro dollar, I mean, the thing that's real apparent is we've got a big zone of prior support that hasn't yet been tested for resistance, and this thing has just continued to break down. If I go down to like a two hour chart, I might be able to pull some reference here for aggressive style strategies. Notice there was like a quick little swing low, a little morning star formation in here off the two hour chart that didn't play. And that could give me a zone of, of lower high resistance potential if I wanted to sell this in a very aggressive manner. And it would basically just be right in there from that little range that had developed off of that bounce that did not hold. So the way I could work with something like this is I need to look for prices to come back and I need it to show actual resistance. I need a closed candle item of resistance off the two or the four hour chart to keep the door open for bearish continuation scenarios. That'd be one way of looking to take a more aggressive stance here with short side euro dollar plays. On the long side, I don't want to touch this with a 10 foot pole. When something has broken down to this degree, sure, the market is likely pretty short, but there's also a reason for this given the levels that it's taken out and the manner with which it's priced in. If I did want to look for pullback thesis in USD, there's probably going to be better places to do it other than looking to take a long on euro dollar. Euro dollar, I look for a pullback so that I could try to sell more. That zone, or even better, this zone, could be used for as such. Cable. So while euro dollar continues to break down and Again, I'm not going to get bullish on this one because this one also just set a fresh low, but I'm just going to do a quick comparison and contrast. 
of why looking to fade euro dollar could be so dangerous right now. While euro dollar has just continued to perch lower, massive down day yesterday, another down day today. Go over to cable. Cable looks like it's at least trying to get its act together. Uh, it it pushed right down to a fresh 2021 low just last week. But yesterday gave a bullish engulf. Notice right in here. Or excuse me, that was Friday. Friday gave us the bullish engulf. We had the doji yesterday, and we've had a bit of continuation here so far today. Now, at this point, this actually looks like it's setting up for short side scenarios off that daily chart. Right, that 135 spot of prior support that could be interesting for resistance potential. Off the four hour, you could see where there is and has been a steady build of higher highs and higher lows. So a couple of different ways that I could demarcate this one. One, and again, if I want to handle the USD move aggressively, look for breakout continuation. I could simply look at that sequence of recent higher highs and higher lows and say, okay, when that thing breaks down, I want to get back on the short side of it if I expect that short side move to continue to develop, right? Because while your dollar still remains pretty oversold and it's gonna to be tough to get a bearish entry without just guessing and hoping, at least I have a bit of bullish structure here in pound dollar that I could wait to break down before I look to get on the short side of that move. Go down to an hourly chart and you can see where that line in the sand, is. I mean, it's right around the 134 spot, right? We had a wick here, 3403, 3401, 3403. Look for a breach of 34, call it a day. Now, alternatively, we haven't yet gotten up to that 135 spot. We got about 25 pips away and then bull shied away. But there may be bigger resistance up there, right around that 135 spot, which is confluent with the midline on this channel that I have. It still is making up a bull flag formation. But that could be another area of lower high resistance potential to look to for bearish cable plays. So it was like two weeks ago, it was like the week of dovish central banks. And there was a lot of them. I mean, we had RBA on Monday. They shocked with by going too dovish or going more dovish than what was expected. Then of course we had the Fed, and then we had the BOE. When Aussie, or the RBA rather, uh, when dovish their rate decision earlier in November, this led to a strong pullback in that Aussie dollar move. And that trend has absolutely changed since then. I have even talked it up as it happened, uh, given the way that that bearish bar had printed the day after RBA. We had this nice little support zone right from like 74.50 to 75 flat. I think I have this on a cleaner chart. No, it's not that one. I had this beautiful, beautiful support zone, prior resistance. This is something that has some historical connotations in Aussie as well. I mean, if you go way back, this is a price that Aussie has had a tendency to like or a zone around the 74.50 to 75 flat area. But you can almost see where that change is getting priced in. You get that massive move lower, breach of support. And then I started looking to this zone for lower high resistance with pulled in right there, just like a day after the rate decision. And since then, that bearish trend has just continued to develop. I still like this one on the long side of the USD. I think there's still some more air that could come out of this thing. You look at this off a daily chart, you got those two wicks that match up right there, and then a very bearish candle today. I wouldn't quite classify this as an evening star pattern, but you could almost see where there's similar tonalities of that, right? Where we had this bounce on Friday, another bullish engulf, got continuation yesterday, but then bears, it's like they saw that high at 73 and two thirds and are like, hey, I'm going to set on this. And then bam, right back down. 72.50 is a big level. 71.85 is a big level. But we are starting to tread deeper within a zone of longer term support that I'm pulling off of this chart here. Okay, daily chart, a couple of fibs in play. Uh, the key one here, I'm taking the May high, drawing that down to the August low. The 23.6% retracement of that major move is at 72.91. And we even have this bullish channel, but that bullish channel, when matched up with the bearish trend, makes for a bear flag formation. Meaning once we start to test the underside of this channel, the door opens for a deeper and deeper bearish move to continue all the way down towards the current 2021 low, and then perhaps even a bit deeper. That 70 big fig, it looms very large and Aussie 
Hasn't been tested since last November. Wouldn't be surprised to see it come back into the equation by the end of this year. You could tell there's good momentum on this thing, or has been good momentum on this thing. Uh, after the RBA went dovish earlier in the month, and then as the Fed has gotten, well, as the case for the Fed to get more and more hawkish is continuing to build. Select the short side of this one. Dollar cat. I'd highlighted this one last week. And if you remember the webinar that we had, um, I believe it was, yeah, we had it at the beginning of this month. Yeah, I still remember this very well. Um, on the weekly chart, I was trying to catch a morning star in dollar cad. And the thing that I said at the very beginning of this webinar will make a little bit more sense once I get to CAD yen. But I digress. So I had bars one and two of a morning star formation. What I needed in late October was I needed bar three to come up and close above 2416. I even still have that mark on my chart from that webinar a couple weeks ago. If it moved above 2416, then I would have had the morning star that filled in. Morning star is a bullish reversal formation. At the time, USD wasn't all that strong. We were still sputtering around, around resistance. But the Canadian dollar started to show more and more signs of weakness to the point where I said, well, you know what? If I want to look for CAD strength, I'm going to do it against something like the yen. I'm not going to trifle with the dollar here, given how both CAD and USD are devoid of trend at the moment. The next week, it started to push up. The formation didn't fill in. It was already negated, but we started to see that strength play. Last week is when this thing started to get a bit more interesting. And that really big move on Wednesday, that was after the inflation print. And prices went right up to the 125 handle. 125 is a major psychological level. You know how we were just looking at 75 on Aussie and, and drawing the story back to the 70 big fig? Those major psychological levels, they can have a really big pull on markets whenever they come into play. Uh, and in and, and dollar CAD, that big fig is 125 flat. Really big major level. And you can see here where that level helped to define the makings, the early makings of that bullish trend. And it was holding real well with the levels. Pullback for support held right at that FIBO. And then on the back of that inflation print last week, there was a really messy bond auction, a really messy treasury auction later on that day. Strong topside run on the pair, and it moves right up to that next FIBO at 25.89. Now, the good news when I see something like this is I have confirmation that I'm not the only one looking at this Fibonacci retracement. It's gotten a little extra importance when I get runs of that nature. And you can see where before the 50 fib was helping to set resistance. We pull back and then we break out and now the 38.2 is helping to set resistance. So that gives me a very ideal target to look to if I could see that bullish continuation run continue on. 27.27 becomes the next spot. That's the 23.6 of that same fib retracement that's so far done a really good job of helping to mark support and resistance, well, at least resistance over the past couple of weeks. So I still like dollar cat higher. The challenge that we have right now, and I looked at this setup last Thursday. Here, I'll even show you what I was working with here. Excuse me, this was Friday. We were hanging around resistance. I was looking for that 125 spot to come into support. Quick bounce. Look for price to move back up. As a matter of fact, at the time, this was again, this was Friday. We were looking at 2565. Look where we're at right now. 2565. Right around that same level. But we had that 125 fill. The worry that I have is this is going to be a lower high. So at this point, I'd be okay with looking at a secondary support play off that 125 support. I'm going to span that down to the 50 fib, 2478 up to 25 flat. Another pullback, 
show support with a candle body closed on the four hour or, or, or older, so four hour or daily, keeps the door open for another bounce, dollar cat. On the other side of this, I'm gonna be very hesitant at chasing breaks of that high. That high comes in right around 2607, but I got a big zone of resistance just above that. There's two longer term Fibonacci levels, like 2621, 2632. I don't want to look to trigger fresh bullish exposure in front of a test of those levels. Those levels had some pull in the pair, uh, quite a bit of pull in the pair, going back to last year, right? That was in January. Uh, yeah, well, earlier this year. You can see where, I mean, it was just setting the tone. Resistance in March. This is again in April. It's it's looks to soon be coming back into the picture. That's something that I want to be careful of uh, trying to trigger fresh long exposure in front of. Okay, last but certainly not least, dollar yen, the rate play. Dollar yen back up towards those highs. I don't think it's got it yet, but it's getting close. Yeah, 1473, that's a big spot. 1473, if we touch that, I think we're looking at a fresh five-year high. But yeah, so, I mean, the story of dollar yen is, I think, pretty enticing given the backdrop. Where the Fed hasn't come out to be effusively hawkish. But I think markets are trying to draw inferences given the data of where the Fed is going to need to be especially if we keep seeing these inflation surprises. At this point, inflation has become political. We started to hear a senator talking about inflation last week after the print. And, and as fl inflation becomes more and more political, I think it might take away more and more of the Fed's toolbox as to what they might be able to do in the event that things turn over or we get an adverse uh, type of driver when it comes to the equation. Dollar yen largely is tracking yields at the moment. And there's a very reasonable reason as to why. It's simply the math behind the two currencies or economies represented by the currencies in the pair. As the US sees higher rates, or as rates in the US continue to tick higher on the back of more positive economic data, uh, a Fed eventually moving into a more hawkish space, recovery continuing to take hold. Does that as all those good things happen, I mean, bond traders aren't stupid. They're not going to sit around and wait for the Fed to say, okay, we're going to hike rates. No, they start to price this in as soon as they have evidence that they might need to price it in. It's the same exact thing we saw in Q1. When the 10-year went from 90 basis points to 176, markets aren't stupid and waiting for the Fed to tell them it's okay for yields to go up. They're constantly trying to dance in front of the Fed. They want to be where the puck is going, not where it's at. And so that's why after the September FOMC rate decision, we saw rates pop up again. And as we've had these positive data items, rates go up again, up again, or like last week, up again. And this, again, early November, Powell didn't quite douse rate hike hopes with a, a bucket of cold water, but he, he stepped on him a bit. He said he wasn't even going to talk about policy. He wasn't going to talk about rates. He was there to announce a taper, and the Fed wants to look for maximum employment. He wouldn't talk about rates. They'll do that in December, though. December is when another dot plot matrix is due. I think at that point, they're going to forecast a second hike. And I don't think it's going to take markets by surprise because markets already started to price in a second hike for 2022. But again, market participants aren't waiting around to see the dot plot matrix before they start pricing that, and they've already done so based on the data, based on the inferences from the Fed. And this is something that continue to play out in the currency market as well, as we can see in something like dollar yen. Dollar yen did not wait around in Q1 for the Fed to get hawkish. It just started going up. Now, the reason this started going up is a little bit more rational in my mind. There's an actual economic reason. The swap or rollover that a trader earns by holding the pair at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Well, hedge funds earn that too. Other market players earn that too. It's a part of FX, interest rate differentials. And if we have higher rates coming out of the US, for whatever reason, if the actual rates 
are moving up as they have been, there's more and more incentive for folks to hold this long. On the other side of the pair, the Japanese yen is represented by a Bank of Japan. It's nowhere near hiking rates. They went to negative rates in 2016 and they haven't looked back since. So as we get these higher and higher rates out of the US, there's more and more and more incentive for folks to be on the long side of dollar yen. That's what led to this really strong run in Q1 notice. I mean, this sinks, remember it was January 6th when the dollar bottomed, it's January 6th when dollar yen bottomed. It was March 31st when the dollar topped, when rates topped, I think rates actually topped on the 30th, but dollar yen tops March 31st, final day of Q1. Those themes have held very well. It even had a very similar ascending triangle formation build in here going into that late September period. We get the jump after the FOMC rate decision, quick pullback, and a breakout, a profuse breakout that saw this thing jump all the way up to, and again, I believe it was four month, uh, excuse me, four year highs that we hit. Yeah, four year highs. November 6th of 2017 is when we hit that 114.73 spot, which hasn't come into play just yet. Um, now, after that run, dollar yen then builds in a falling wedge. Now, remember when we looked at a falling wedge that didn't work, a falling wedge that got invalidated in euro dollar? Well, here's one that did work. And real simple, this basically took on the tonality of a bull flag formation. Bull flag is often what's going to happen when a really strong move prices in. There's nobody left on the sidelines to buy. And so we get into a bearish channel until we hit a point of support that does bring more folks into the equation to push for that fresh high. Well, this had a similar tonality of that, but it wasn't a parallel channel. Oops. As much as it was a wedge. Buyers were even more aggressive in supporting the bid that they wouldn't allow for a parallel channel to develop. But a falling wedge, often approached with the aim of bullish reversals, like we saw in the euro dollar, the one that did not work as we had invalidation when prices broke down. This is one that did work as prices filled in, broke out, and have so far continued higher. The next major spot is up here at that 114.75 area. But this is something that I think could be usable. Could be usable. Now, like I said at the very beginning of this webinar, I think one of the benefits available to FX traders is the flexibility that's afforded from two-sided pairs. Well, when you look at dollar yen, it's not like Apple, where your choice is a binary. Do you want to buy or no? Well, you could either buy or not buy it. And if you're long, you could buy more or you could sell. It's a binary choice. And FX, I got a lot of choices here. So in this case, I, I love the dollar, the dollar higher, and I like the yen lower. I don't like the juxtaposition of the current dollar yen chart. So what can I do? Real simple. As I've looked through a series of other USD markets, like maybe Aussie dollar. Okay, well, I could look for my long dollar exposure there because this one still has a setup that I could work with on a, on a, on a, on a shorter term basis. The side of the yen, there's something I could do there too. I simply need to find a currency that I'm okay with for strength, mesh that up with the yen, that I'm looking for weakness, and then try to let that play. So pound yen is in a very interesting spot at the moment. Pound yen, very similar to dollar yen, started off Q4 with a really hot spring in its step. Ran all the way up to multi-year highs, I think in pound yen, Sorry, there's a lot going on in this chart. Yeah, we got like five-year highs in pound yen here. But we got up to that spot. Here's another formation that didn't work. It started to put in a bull flag and then it just uh, around the BOE, when the BOE went dovish earlier this month, the bottom just fell out of this thing. Went all the way down until it caught support at the 152.50 psychological level. This is not a foreign level to pound yen. Not quite a rounded bottom, but it has a similar tonality where you could really see there was a lot of grind going on around that support. But more recently, as in this morning, we caught price pushing up to a fresh higher high. There may be the makings of a bullish trend in this thing yet. 
I wouldn't be too caught off guard by that trend line projection, but it is something to keep in mind given how it's done a really solid job of holding the high so far this morning. But real simply, I could take on a conditional approach, take out that high to show me that you could deal through that resistance. And once you do, well, then I can look for price to move to that next spot of resistance, like 154.76 to 155 flat. Or conversely, I could even get a little bit tighter with this trend. I can say, you know what? I got some decent support there around 153.50. Look for a support hold in that area. And so now I can hit this thing in two ways. I can either play the top side break on a brief fresh highs, or I can play a pullback down to that 153.50 area. Prior resistance turn support, looking for bullish continuation plays. At that point, I could even even have a prior higher low to work with, about 50 pips below that. Uh, area of invalidation, if you will. If I get my dip to support, invalidation here. If it breaks down, I don't want to be hanging around to see how wrong I might have been anyways. But a short-term bullish trend that could see the longer-term bullish trend coming back into order, possibly. But that's how I could work with that weak yin. I, would be a little bit more challenged to do so here because as I shared on Aussie dollar, I think that Aussie has greater breakdown potential at the moment. But, you know, again, if the yen is weaker than Aussie, the, the pair could still move higher. So I've been following this one as well. Currently, I have it in a bearish spot, like off this daily chart. You can see where this wicket pulled up. And we caught some quick sellers. If it closes like this, it's still going to be fairly bearish to me, all the way down to like 81.50, maybe 82. Um, but if it can get its act together today and close that candle blue, then I'm going to have a decent-ish short-term trend to be working with here on like the two-hour chart. Similar, fresh higher high. Now I'm just trying to catch that higher low. At this point, it was looking like that higher low was going to price around 83 and three quarters, but it's slipping on me, which again is why I say this candle needs to close green today to keep bullish prognostications alive on the pair. The one I would absolutely not want to do this with, just given how weak it has been, would be Euro, Euro Yen specifically. Euro has just been absolutely smashed over the past couple of days. And I can't find a single thing that makes me want to get along here. <laughs> that makes me want to look to fade this move. Uh, but that, my friends, is what I have for today on the FX front. I want to go through a couple of other markets, but feel free to type your questions in. Uh, happy to take as many as I possibly can while we're in the uh, Q&A portion of the webinar. I'm going to be on tomorrow again with a, um, with a midweek webinar with IG, which is why I did not advertise this one. So anybody that's in this one today, I want to try to answer your questions if you have them. Uh, because you guys showed up even without being notified that uh, that it was gonna that it was gonna happen. All right, so cryptos, cryptos are on their back foot for right now, and you know, given how aggressively these things had run, it. I mean, for healthy trend development, you need two sided moves. You know, parabolas are real tough to trade, and make for a highly speculative type of environment. I mean, case in point, look what's going on in Tesla right now. It's like dogfight in there. Thousands have been holding the support, but man, this thing is all over the place. Parabolas, they're not fun to trade. It's a lot more guessing game than, than I prefer. Uh, but some of these crypto markets are putting in what so far has been a semi-orderly pullback, like in Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin's off like 12% from the high last week, which you know it sounds like a lot, but it's Bitcoin. So... The swings in either direction are usually pretty violent. Uh, that fresh high, it came in right at 69,000 last week, 69,000 flat. That sounds like a high that might stick around for a little bit, in my opinion, if I had to guess, given the Bitcoin crowd. Um, but after that high was printed, and again, this was around last Wednesday when a lot of these things started turning. Um, it was off as much as 15% to this morning's low and it pulled right back above that 60K spot. 60K has been a, a very decent area of support here. 
And so this is an area where I would expect to see some bulls jump in to try to defend the floor or the perceived floor in recent Bitcoin price action. I would not be so bullish there. Instead, I would look for prices to move down to that next level. You can see where we had this one bar like two weeks ago. This stretched down to that 23.6 Fibo retracement before it bounced. I think there around that 56,400 area could be more of a perceived value. But, you know, again, take a step back. This trend has been, you know, very hot to trot. And we're just now seeing RSI dip back below the 50 marker. You know, so even with this thing grinding higher, that little move has helped RSI to reset. Uh, the crypto market that I'd be a little more open to, looking to play pullbacks on, would be Ethereum. Ethereum was in a really solid channel for a very long time. Right in here. And so after an all-time high in May, we had this digestion that lasted until late September. And again, that, that kind of syncs up with around the Fed's rate warning around the September FOMC rate decision. After that, Ethereum went in this bullish channel that was just incredible. I mean, so incredibly consistent on both sides walking all the way up to a fresh ATH. Kind of like Bitcoin though. Bitcoin has the 60K marker and Ethereum, it's got the 4,200 marker. Uh, yeah, so 420, I get it now. But that's right off of those highs. It then came in as resistance, then support, and it's back in play today. But that 4K marker, is right there. That was a prior all time, or uh, excuse me, a prior swing high. And that also syncs up at the 38.2% Fibber retracement. I, I'm a little bit more bullish, a little bit more aggressive for topside plays in Ether than I am in Bitcoin. And the reason is because of the usability around it. Bitcoin has that link as digital gold, as an inflation hedge. That makes sense. But as far as usability in the crypto sphere, it really does seem as though Ethereum is has a longer lifespan. Stocks. There we are, pressing the ATH. So I don't really have much to say here. Um, I mean, price action in stocks has been aggressively bullish for a very long time. And we've had a couple of fits and starts of something else, but what we haven't had yet is a rug pull from the Fed. Think about that. The Fed has done so far, you know, it. there's a lot of criticism that could be levied on the Fed, but if you take it from a perspective that the Fed wants markets to not collapse while they pull the economy off of the life support that they've given it, the Fed's done a pretty good job so far. Now, again, this is not a grade we're going to be able to properly give until a couple of years down the road. But at this point, the Fed has begun to taper asset purchases, and they've warned us that higher rates are on the way. And stock prices haven't fallen over yet. So from that perspective, the way they may be seeing it could be a positive. Now, there's, there's knock-on effects of all that, right? kind of what we've seen in um, like in Tesla, some of these meme stocks, cryptocurrencies. I mean, there's been a lot of little bubbles building all over the place or what we perceive as being little bubbles all over the place. But the Fed has to go down to priorities at this point. And I think their big concern about going maybe a little bit too hawkish is that this whole thing could turn over very, very fast. It hasn't yet. But when we had the Evergrande concern there in September starting to, 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 to rear its ugly head, notice where stocks were pretty vulnerable for a while, even through the September FOMC rate decision. That September FOMC rate decision, it gave us a quick wick of strength, but they came right back down. Stocks eventually got their act back together, but 
this has been a Fed supported market. And the Fed doesn't look to be pulling the rug at any point in the near term. So this is also especially relevant to the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ is rate sensitive. As we see rates go back up, the NASDAQ usually has a little bit more pressure on it. But as that move has been fairly orderly of late, NASDAQ's going right back up towards those ATHs. I would be less apt to chase this one near those highs than the S&P. But nonetheless, both of these indices have been straight up, and there's no sign yet that that trend is about to end. That's all I got to say on stocks. And that, my friends, is what I have for today. I want to say thank you so much for me for your time. I really, really do appreciate it. I'm not going to have time for questions today, but I am going to have time for questions tomorrow at the midweek checkup. Uh, if you have time to visit with me, I'll be hosting that from 9.30 a.m. tomorrow until 10.30 a.m. And I uh, hope to see you in the room. But thanks so much for your time. I hope you have a fantastic rest of the day. And as always, happy trading, ladies and gentlemen.